This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. The complex derivative is much cooler than the regular derivative that we learned in Calc 1 for real functions. And that's because if you are told a function is differentiable, like x squared, or just a general f of x, and then you're asked to say something else about that function just based off that information, there's not much you could say that's too exciting. I mean, you could say it's continuous, you could say there are no corners or cusps or anything like that. And you can also say, you know, the, the mean value theorem applies, but past that kind of stuff, again, nothing too exciting. With the complex derivative, not the case. If you know the complex derivative exists and maybe some other minor things about it, you can answer some questions about some seemingly unrelated functions, and we're going to get a glimpse of that later. But first, we've got to understand the intuition of what it means for a function to have a derivative of like 2 plus i. Now, I know what you're thinking. Zach, I didn't hear a word of what you just said because I was staring at that floating globe behind you. I got that comment so much in the last video. So I just want to actively say, you can get this on STEM Merch. This is available. I'll put a link above and down below if you want to support the channel and get this for yourself. But now I'm going to go off screen so we can kind of see how this all works. Now, when thinking about just the regular derivative, it can be more helpful to not think of it like the slope of the tangent at some point on the single two-dimensional plot. But rather think of a one-dimensional number line for the input, this is x, and then one for the output, and we'll use the function x squared. So this is y. If we put in one, we get out one. If we put in two, we get out four. Three goes to nine, and so on. Now, to visualize the derivative at any point, just place our input dot there. I'll remove the other numbers, so imagine we are very zoomed into x equals 2 and y equals 4 right now. And then move the input a little to the right. Call that distance dx, and look at how far the output traveled in response, or dy. In this case, it moved 4 times further than the dx, so the ratio, or derivative, at x equals 2 is 4. This is useful because everything moves in one dimension, rather than like up and to the right with the tangent line. When we move to equations with three variables, it becomes a little more obvious why we do this. Because now the input can be any x, y coordinate, and that will map to a single z coordinate. Normally you graph that on a third dimension, but separating the output z from the input space allows us to analyze the small changes better. I can move the input in any direction on the plane. Choosing to move just a little to the right, a small change in x, yields an output that moves four times further. So we say the partial derivative of z with respect to x at this point is four. If I instead move the input up a little bit, then the output responds differently. It moves twice as much. Thus the partial with respect to y at the same point is two. See, this is a nice visualization because it easily allows us to see that output physically change in response to the changing input. When dealing with a 3D plot, that change can be harder to see. But with complex functions, there are four dimensions. So now we have to use this method. The input and the output space will both be two-dimensional. Now we can input any complex number, like 2 plus i, where you'll notice the y-axis is just the imaginary component. If we use the function z squared, then the output is 3 plus 4i, which can be solved with basic foiling. And from here, as we move the input around, the output changes accordingly. One thing that's really important to realize for later is that for any arbitrary input, x plus iy, we can simplify and split the output into its real and imaginary components. So when we put in 2 plus i, or 2 and 1 for x and y respectively, then the real part comes out as 3, and the imaginary part comes out as 4. So 3 plus 4i, just like we got. Remember that. But now, the derivative of a complex function basically matches exactly that of real functions. The function z squared has a derivative of 2z as expected. But if the input is something like 2 plus i, the derivative at that point is 4 plus 2i. So what does that mean, to have a complex derivative? Well, it's really the same as what we've been seeing. 
Let's zoom into the input and output points and move the input just a little to the right. We can call that whatever we want. I'll say DZ. And note that the output moved about 4.47 times further. That is the magnitude of the complex derivative. It's how far the point 4 plus 2i is from the origin. So that tells us, just like before, how much further the output moves compared to the input for any small change in any direction. Then, if we call to the right 0 degrees, then the output moved at an angle of 26.6 degrees, roughly, relative to that, which is the phase of this complex number. It's the angle from the positive x-axis, and this is what the complex derivative tells us. It reveals the ratio of the distances and the difference in the angles in regards to how the input moves versus the output. Meaning, if instead the input moved at an angle of 45 degrees, some small distance, then the output would move still 4.47, or root 20 times further, at an angle of 71.6 degrees, which is still 26.6 more than the 45 for the input. And from this you can see that if the derivative has no imaginary component, like at z equals 2 plus 0i in this case, then any small change in the input will result in the output moving in the same direction or the direct opposite. Here it's the same because the phase of the derivative is 0 degrees. Thus the difference between the angles for the input and output is 0, so they move in the same direction. If the derivative were a negative real number, then the phase would be 180 degrees and they'd move in opposite directions. One consequence of this two-dimensional motion for both inputs and outputs is you have to be really careful when looking at whether a function is truly differentiable. The first example most students learn is the conjugate function, which reflects all inputs about the real axis. 2 plus i goes to 2 minus i. 0.5i goes to negative 0.5i. And 1 goes to 1. Basically, all of the real components stay the same, while the imaginary components are multiplied by negative 1. This function is differentiable nowhere, but it's continuous everywhere. Because at some point, like 0.5i, if you move up a little bit, the output will move down that same amount, so in the opposite direction, and this needs to stay consistent. But if you move to the right, the output will move in the same direction. So it doesn't stay the same, which means the derivative doesn't exist. In more technical terms, it means the limit doesn't exist, the one which defines the derivative. You don't think about this as much with real functions. When you visualize the derivative at some point as the slope that the secant line approaches as the difference between your fixed point of interest and another approaches zero. This can only happen in two ways, approaching from the right or from the left. With the complex derivative, you have to think of one point sliding towards the other from all directions in the xy plane and make sure the limits all match. If they don't, then the function is not differentiable at that point. Now, there's several interesting results that come from the complex derivative simply existing, but one of my favorites would be this here. If you have two paths in the complex plane that meet at some point, where the angle between them we'll call theta, then send them both through a function whose derivative exists and is non-zero at the intersection point, like z squared, the angle between the paths will not change. It'll still be theta. Yes, these resulting paths aren't even linear, but that angle refers to the one between the tangent vectors for the two paths at the intersection point. The angle you'd measure if you zoomed into the paths until they looked essentially linear. This angle preserving transformation is called a conformal map, and it applies to all complex functions that are differentiable but non-zero at whatever your intersection point is. Here I'll do the same thing but for the function e to the z. After that transformation, again, the angle is preserved in regards to the tangent vectors. The transformation looks even better though when you do it for all the grid lines, all the x equals a constant and y equals a constant lines, because they all meet at right angles of course. So if we map those to their outputs, then those right angles should be preserved at all points where the derivative is non-zero. I'll use z squared here, 
and pay attention to like this intersection here. After the transformation, those output curves still meet at right angles. And when you zoom in, that becomes more obvious. If we do the transformation with e to the z, then same thing. It looks messier, but all those grid lines transform to either circles centered at the origin or diagonal lines, and those all meet at right angles. But there's something else that results directly from this. Remember from before, we can represent a complex function in terms of its real and imaginary components. Now think about what will happen if we set this real part, x squared minus y squared, to a constant, I'll choose 2, graph that curve on our input plane, still the complex plane, and map all those points through our function z squared. Well, these are all the points where x squared minus y squared equals 2. So plugging any of those points into this here will yield an output of 2 for the real component. Therefore, the output can only lie on this vertical line, which has a real component of 2. And then I'll do the same thing for the imaginary component. Set that equation to a constant. I'll choose 1. Graph that and plug in all those complex coordinates to z squared. When these go into the imaginary component, we only get out 1. So all of the outputs will lie on this horizontal line, which has an imaginary coordinate of 1. Now regardless of how far the outputs extend along these lines, we know if the original curves on the left intersect, then the outputs on the right must intersect at this point here and at a right angle. Since angles are preserved through this conformal mapping, then the two original curves must intersect at right angles which they do. And this would apply for any constants that we choose. So simply because z squared is differentiable and non-zero if we ignore the origin, then we know this equation and this one, known as the level curves, must intersect at right angles outside of the origin for any constant values. And if we plot those curves for many values of c1 and c2, we find that is exactly what happens. I think that's really interesting because these don't seem related at all. It would not be super easy to answer the question of at what angle does this curve intersect this one? But once you realize these are the level curves that come from the simple function z cubed and separating that into real and imaginary components, then you know, oh yeah, they must intersect at right angles since the derivative exists and is non-zero at those points. And this does have applications. In physics or engineering, you can use conformal maps to move from a complicated domain to a simpler one, do some analysis there, and then map everything back. So just another way complex numbers and complex analysis can and does apply to real-world problems. There are several other cool examples of how complex functions or derivatives almost magically seem to show up in physics, applied math, or engineering, but I'm going to save that for a future video because I want to go into more depth. But to continue exploring topics within applied math, physics, and engineering, then I definitely recommend checking out CuriosityStream, this video's sponsor. This here is a documentary called The Secret Life of Chaos, which actually discusses some of the beauty behind complex numbers, like with the Mandelbrot set. Then it also goes over how patterns in chaos apply to computer algorithms, population growth, and just the universe around us. Another series they have related to all this though is Nature's Mathematics, which covers patterns and mathematical beauty found in nature, like is the case with the Fibonacci sequence. So there's a lot to explore on this platform for the math and science enthusiasts out there. CuriosityStream is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. But if you sign up by using the link below, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in giving it a try. And with this, you'll have unlimited access to top documentaries that I'm sure many of you will enjoy. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.